Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today we are going to get into garden maintenance and just taking care of all of your plants and what does that look like. So what we're going to do is go through each one of my plants. We're going to uh, look at ways that we could make it healthier, whether that be nutrients, um, taking off some foliage, removing disease parts. We're going to look for insect problems, treat those insect problems with some different natural solutions that I have. Uh, possibly even fertilize some plants and talk about plant growth cycles and a whole myriad of things related to plants. So whether you're a beginning gardener or you've been gardening for a while, I hope that there's a couple things or many things that you could take away from this video. Okay, so the first plant on our agenda is going to be summer squash. These are plants that take a lot of maintenance throughout the summer because of this. You're seeing a lot of leaves that will yellow and die and fall off. Because it produces so much foliage, you know, you can end up with problems with powdery mildew, especially later on in the season. It's almost guaranteed that you're gonna get powdery mildew at some point. So helping to remove the dead and dying foliage is a way to help mitigate some of that um, and other disease issues that might arise. So this is something I do about once a week, come in, remove the dead leaves. Uh, and during that time, I can also check on other issues with the plant. Another thing I would do is remove any unpollinated fruit or fruit that is rotting or dying off. Anything where the plant is having to waste its energy to either try to heal it um, or maintain it, whatever that may be, we want to remove those things um, that are wasting energy. And if you haven't seen how I built my raised beds or what I did for the nutrition for these raised beds, check out this video. You can see the full build and layout of how I built this garden. Then the only other thing that I'm going to need is just some Felco pruners. These are not exactly Felcos, but I can't find them right now, but uh, those are my favorite types of pruners. The squash plant has spines on it, so you may want to wear gloves. It can also be kind of irritating to the skin. That's why I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. So a lot of these you can just pull off just by pulling the opposite way that it's growing and it'll snap where I can come in here and snip them. I just want to be sure to snip it close to the main vine there. And that'll help it heal and there won't be other things rotting off. So I'm just coming through, I'm looking, and I'm looking up the plant to see what it's actually connected to, make sure I'm removing the correct leaf that I don't want to get rid of. Okay, so here's a great example. Something just happened. So that just tore off. This has some sort of uh, root rot issue or there's some bugs that are attacking it. Yeah, it looks like there are bugs that are eating this. I don't see the exact culprit, but that's okay. The plants actually will keep growing even if they're destroyed like this, as you can see. So I just need to be more careful to not move this at all so that I don't break it and then completely kill the plant. So something else, if I notice that there's a leaf that's underneath everything else and that's really not getting sun, it's really just wasting energy for the plant. So those are other things that I might want to remove. And, and the things that are just laying on the dirt underneath, not getting any sun, they're eventually going to yellow off and die anyways. So sometimes I'll even remove those. Like there is some chard in here. So these outer lower chard leaves, I'm going to take off. And everything here that you're seeing me toss off, that can either be made into compost or I will probably just, you know, soak this overnight with my pig feed let it ferment and get broken down, and then I'll just feed it to my pigs. So that's what I will be doing. Chickens are another great livestock to feed with all this stuff. So none of this goes to waste. So we have one more summer squash to deal with, but this has powdery mildew everywhere. So we're gonna come back and do this last, just so I don't spread those spores to other places in the garden. I don't wanna help this fungal problem out. Okay, so now we've got these old corn beds. We harvested, I don't know how many years of corn, like probably close to 60, 60 to 80 ears of corn, something like that this year. And it's time to remove these. So I'm gonna be doing this garden completely no dig, which means I will not be pulling roots up and out of the ground whenever I can. There are some plants or some situations where I wanna get it out of the way so I can plant something else. But many times I'm just gonna to try to find a way to work with it. So when I come in here to this corn, I'll just, clip it at the base and let the roots rot under the ground. That's gonna feed microbes and all sorts of creatures. Uh, so in order to have healthier soil, leaving behind some of that previously grown plant material is actually a good thing uh, and will help grow the plant. Now, when I bring in more transplants or plant seeds, I can just plant around that really easily. It's not gonna get in the way. And certain plants like your brassicas or your lettuces or some things like that, 
cut a little bit lower than the base of the plant at the soil level so that it doesn't regrow leaves. If you're trying to run a direct seed or something like in a soil bed, this technique can be problematic, but there's ways to work with it as well. So just another huge soil health concept to know about is this no dig method of leaving roots behind. So I'll be cutting these down and I'll just leave the corn for now on top as a natural mulch. I'm gonna come back and plant some seeds here though in the future. Okay, so the next summer plant we're gonna maintain is our basil. Now this basil is absolutely huge now and I should have even harvested it earlier. That would have been better, but that's okay. We let it grow, it got crazy. Now let's harvest it and I just bought about eight blocks of Parmesan so that I can make a ton of pesto and then freeze it. But let's say you're not ready to harvest and you're seeing the plant going to flower like this. What you wanna do is just snap the top of these flowers off. And I'm pinching at the base there. You can even take off this, this layer where these two leaves are coming out. You'll notice below, there's actually two new growth points. This will set out two new stems and leaves. So effectively what this does is doubles the plant. So here's an example of that. Okay, this middle one was plucked out when I harvested for making basil or whatever I was doing. The two other growth points grow up. Instead of it having a single stem, now it's got two stems. So if you do this early in the plant's life, you can create a very bushy and very productive basil plant. So on this side, the, the basil flower's gotten a little bit crazier on this plant. So I need to just come through and just really quickly, you don't need to take your time. You don't need to sit there and worry about, oh, am I gonna rip off too many leaves? Just get in there and uh, pull things off quickly and fast. You wanna make your jobs in the garden quick and efficient. You don't wanna have to be out here for hours and hours because then you'll, you'll dread these chores um, and you won't get out here enough to keep your garden in good condition. So try to uh, use good techniques and fast techniques so they'll, they'll get you in and out of here quickly so you can get on with other things you know, another quick, 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 quick way to do this is just to take some garden shears and just just cut everything and, and scale it back. But the best way to maintain the plant, if you want to get the most volume of harvest, is to do the technique I talked about of doubling the plant and then staying on top of your harvest so that the plant doesn't even want to start flowering because you're not allowing it uh, the time to change into the flowering state of the plant. Um, if you keep taking the leaves, it'll just want to keep producing more leaves to stay in a vegetative state. Um, so we're kind of playing with that a little bit by removing the flowers like this. Now because this plant is so big and crazy, I'm taking it out one, two, I'm going down three nodes and, and cutting there. Because lower down I can see that there's more new growths that want to come up and out. So I'm gonna just really encourage that to happen. Okay guys, so here's my huge basil harvest. This is like... Five pounds or more of basils probably. So I'm gonna go inside and make this pesto immediately once I'm done out here. So that this is really, really fresh. And one key to keeping basil fresh when I was selling it was harvest it, be careful not to bruise or smash the leaves that will cause it to brown. And then just put it in a plastic bag, unsealed. Putting a paper towel in can help. Moisture that is either on the leaves from morning dew or that develops as it off gases um, from decomposing. That moisture is gonna encourage microbes to decompose this and it's gonna go bad quicker. So keeping it dry and in the fridge, I almost like leaving the bag kind of halfway open um, so that it get, got some fresh air. And I noticed that the basil stayed fresher a bit longer. Okay, so now we need to manage these cucumbers. So what's wrong with these? Well, I'm seeing aphids. I'm seeing, yeah, lots of aphids and I'm seeing ants. Ants will actually mine the aphids for the sugars and juices that they create. So what we're going to do is remove all these dead dying leaves and it's definitely, you know, from aphid damage, these little, you know, yellowy spots and stuff, maybe, maybe there's some sort of fungal issue, but it's probably just areas where the aphids have sucked uh, the plant dry there. So because this has aphids on it, I want to get this out of here. I don't want to leave these leaves. I don't want to leave behind. Okay. These are, these are diseased. These have aphids on them. So we're gonna get them out of here. And I don't wanna take off too many because you know some of these leaves, even though they don't look great, they're still able to photosynthesize. So I just need to keep an eye on this. And this is an area that we will treat with our natural pesticides that we will show you later. So once I'm seeing that the leaves are a little bit healthier looking, 
Um, there's not so many aphids on them. I'll leave those leaves to allow for photosynthesis. So we can't get too aggressive. If you wanna watch a great cucumber video on how to maintain cucumbers like really in depth, I have a great video on that as well. But yeah, everything else on this, I would just leave for now. A fruit is looking good. Obviously this trellis is not incredible. What I'll do though is I ran, you know, it ran up and now I'm running it back down, trying to buy it as much time as possible and trying to spread out this light as good as possible. So I just ran them up and then back down. This trellis is just made for some bamboo I got from free. And this is trellis netting that I've had for years. Uh, came on a big roll and I just keep using it for random things here and there. So now on to the tomato here. Now this I pruned to a single liter at the beginning of the plant's life. And I have a really in-depth video all about um, identifying tomato suckers and pruning them that you should check out. Now that it's grown taller, you know, I'm not using a trellis um, or any other special type of device. I'm just using a tomato cage. This is an indeterminate vining type tomato. So it's gonna continue to grow up and up and up forever. And I pruned it till about here probably to single liter and then I just let it go crazy um, at that point. So I can try to get as much fruit and flowers as possible. I've let it go pretty crazy though. So these other suckers here at the top, I'm gonna get rid of them because they're just gonna keep getting bigger and make the plant too bushy um, and too top heavy. So I'll just let the top of the plant go to single liter. And then looking down at the bottom, the bottom area of your tomato plant is an, always an area where you're gonna have um, dead or dying leaves. And that's completely normal if they're yellowing. Um, you know, these do not look as healthy at the bottom. They're not gonna get as much sunlight either. So that's why I'm taking these, this bottom three just out of there. They just don't look that healthy. There's no point to really keep them there. I'm gonna leave these lower suckers on here just cause they're, it makes them easy to harvest. They're not gonna flop over super crazy. So now that this plant is producing and going crazy, I don't have a trellis. For me, it just makes sense just to let it keep going and let it you know, put out a bunch of fruit. The reason that we do wanna prune in general is just because we're trying to get our the biggest, juiciest, most nutritious fruit. Um, the, Tomato plant itself, of course, it wants to spread its seed everywhere. So it's focused on creating as many tomato seeds as possible. We are really selecting it for really high quality and high volume of fruit. So that's kind of the idea behind uh, single stem or double stem pruning and why farmers do that. Okay, so this plant doesn't look as healthy. Taking out that sucker, it's just in the way. All this bottom stuff is just not very healthy. It's not really getting sunlight. Oh, here we go, we got one. Of course, while you're doing this part of your maintenance, you're always looking for bugs. This is the very famous tomato hornworm. These guys can demolish your plant super fast. Not to be scared of though, they can't bite you or anything. They're just uh, nasty. Now, one way to help find those tomato worms, if you're seeing large poops uh, from worms, that is a huge indicator. Start looking around. Obviously, if you're missing a lot of leaves like I am here, I mean, these branches, they just have no, no leaves on them. I'm just gonna pull those off. They really have no point. These weird suckers that are developing just out of the center of these branches, maybe a little bit tricky to see, but this is a flower cr cluster. So you see the fruit, flowers, and then all of a sudden, there's another flower cluster again, and then here there's a sucker. Okay, so just a sucker grew out of the end of a flower cluster, and it happened here too, actually. So when this type of thing happens, typically what I will do is just come in and just snip it. Allow those flowers to go, right? It already spent the energy to create all this. I'll take that sucker out too. So now what we're left with is it'll terminate at the flower and stop and not put out any more. I can see that the, there has another sucker here. So this plant has something wrong with it, I can tell. I am slightly concerned about maybe a herbicide residue in that mushroom compost just based upon how a couple of different crops are responding. Okay, so next up is the watermelon here, uh, which is doing really excellent. Now, I grew this in the corner of a box, right? And I've actually got, I've got two watermelon plants planted in the corner here. So one here and one here. And as you can see, it's just an excellent way of not using a ton of space in your box. So you just let it grow up and out. It just takes up the corner. As that's happening, some of the 
uh, vines are going to want to go out and go other places. What you like, like this one, he's, he's going deep into the bed. So all you need, you need to do is come in, gently remove it. If there are some tendrils attached, you can rip off tendrils and then send the growth some other direction that you want it to go somewhere towards the sun. If you're in a really compact area with not a lot of room, then, you know, I recommend you can kind of spread out your vines here. Sometimes they'll get hung up on each other, a little confused. And if you can kind of tease them out, especially when you got two right next to each other, they can kind of tangle up. And in order to get all the plants the most light possible, just, you know, really gently try to separate them apart, trying to help them spread out more. So this is something I can do with my winter squash as well. And it also gives me a chance to try to identify where are the watermelons that are growing well. And maybe I need to, if it's growing on just straight up dirt, it is nice to put like some straw underneath. The risk of rot goes way down if it's dry underneath the melon. So right here I'm on some landscape fabric, so that'll be fine. Also spreading this out, it gives more access to the pollinators for the male and female flowers. So the pollen from a male flower needs to enter the female flower. The females will have a little nub at the end where that, it, once it's pollinated, will turn into the watermelon. Just like on a squash plant, if these flowers don't get pollinated, they'll just drop the female fruit off it, and it won't turn into a full fruit. So when you're growing melons, once they get close to harvest, when they get really big, you want to start coming out, checking them every day. So I'm going to give you three great tips on picking a ripe watermelon. Probably four tips, actually. So the number one thing that should tell you you should start looking at all the other factors is that this tendril has dried out. So it'll get brown, limp, and fall over. At that point, you're going to want to tap your watermelon. And this is a skill that takes some time. Maybe you go through 10 watermelons to really understand what that sound should sound like. If it's too tinny or high-end, high-pitched, uh, it is not ripe enough. Uh, the perfect sound is sort of like a resonant drum sort of sound where it has a little bit of um, middle frequencies in there. If we're gonna talk music theory here. Um, and then if it's too ripe, it'll have a thud sound. So it won't reverberate, it'll just kind of go and then the final thing which if the tendril is dried out it's gonna have a really nice white or yellow spot on the bottom and then after that you know if you wiggle on this stem it already started to break there's another little sign but for me the big thing I always go by is the tendril and the sound so take a look at the peppers they look great you know I can come through and look remove any dead or dying leaves. I don't really prune my peppers. I just let them grow and they do what they do. Um, you know, looking for any bugs, things like that. I don't see any infestation, so looks super healthy. Coming down here to the chard, you know, I want to remove some, if there's any bad leaves here. And also I want to think about, you know, is this chard shading out my pepper plant here. Well, yeah, in the mornings, it is blocking out some sunlight here. So what I can do is just harvest out a bunch. It's good for the plant to get thinned out a, a bit every now and again anyway. So here, let's open it up. I'll make dog food out of this stuff. And now we've just given a bunch more light to the pepper plant behind here. So sometimes your plants can be doing so healthy that they'll actually slow down the growth of another plant. So. Just thinking about, hey, you know, can I cook this up or something? Or, you know, just some of my animals want to eat it. I could feed this to my chickens if I wanted to. If you, when you have this overabundance, it's really nice to just be able to feed some back to some animals. So now we're in with the okra. Okra is not something that I have grown very much because I don't like okra. And okra wasn't something that sold well at the farmer's markets where I used to live. So... Um, just trying out some okra to try eating it and cooking it again, seeing if I can learn to like it, because it is a great vegetable. Now, the thing with the okra, uh, I haven't done anything to my okra other than just plant the transplants from seed. Now, it is getting hit by a lot more bugs. I've noticed it's more susceptible, but it's pretty strong. Um, on these ones, you'll see there's a pretty big aphid infestation, and most of that's caused by the ants mining the aphids. 
So what I'm going to show you is I've talked a lot about Jadam natural pesticides and I actually have a friend that I met uh, learning from Master Cho a couple years ago uh, and he makes his own Jadam based pesticides and sells them. So I'm not sponsored by him or anything. He's just uh, a friend of mine. So rather than making my own Jadam wedding agent, like a soap, uh, the Jadam herbal solution and Jadam sulfur, he makes it and can just send that to you and you can use it right away. So that's what's so cool and I'm, I'm really happy to see more people making the own, their own natural solutions and actually selling it because not everybody wants to deal with making it um, or they're not ready to, they don't have the ability to make it yet. So it's a great way if you want a natural pesticide, this is what I would recommend over spinosad or some of these other. This is just made from extracting uh, plant chemicals and soap, which is just like three ingredients. The pesticide I have from him right now is actually uh, is a pepper base, so that'll actually be really good for the soft-bodied insects of the aphids. All right, let's mix that up and then spray it onto our plants here. So before we spray that, I want to show you guys. We're about at least a month after I filmed that last part of the video. Here's that okra that I wanted to spray with aphids as an example. So what I want to show you is, did I need to spray that? to get rid of the aphids? No, the plant made it through and survived. So what I wanna emphasize and what I've always emphasized on my channel and the entire time I've been farming is that nature will balance itself. Now there may be times when the balance is so out of whack and it's so bad or you're a farmer and you're gonna lose thousands of dollars worth of produce, then is a good time to use a very um, powerful method like a Jadam pesticide. So I've never used a pesticide on my old farms. I never used a pesticide here in Tennessee where the bug pressure is even higher in this garden, growing all sorts of crops. So uh, before I show you the pesticide, I just also wanna say that it is not a necessary thing. I have yet to need it, okay? Like, but I also gave you the example of, there may be some extreme example where you do need it. That's why I wanna show you what I think in my opinion, this is the most powerful, natural, and least harmful to beneficials um, thing that you could make. Um, I had a passion fruit over here that was getting attacked by a ton of caterpillars. You know, if I only had one of those plants, or I've got a couple fruit trees and they're just getting devoured by something and it's a brand new fruit tree that you planted, spray it so you can save your $20 tree. Or, you know, you, it spent a year in the ground and you're gonna lose all that time, yes use the natural pesticide, spray it, get rid of it, so you don't lose your tree. Okay, so it's just a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis. In general though, no, you never have to use anything. What's wonderful is we have these Jadam pesticides now that you can make at home. Just go buy the Jadam book, I'll put a link in the description. It explains everything. And Jack, who makes these pesticides, um, is a huge proponent of the Jadam philosophy of make it on your own. But if you don't want to make it on your own, he makes it for you and he did a very good job doing it. So, let's mix this up. You need one gallon of distilled water. It must be distilled or soft so that it doesn't leave hard water marks on your plants. So this is the wetting agent, which is the soap I described uh, with the hot pepper Jadam herbal solution in it. This is the sulfur, so this is the big bomb in uh, natural pesticides. Adding this, this will take care of powdery mildew or any of the harsher insects. Now you can do, of course, a stronger or a lighter dose of this, depending on the infestation. He gives great recommendations on that. So we're gonna do two ounces, which with this nice squeezy bottle, you just squeeze it up inside of there. So for an infestation, he says add a half ounce up to one ounce per gallon. Okay, so we're just gonna go on the lower end and do that half ounce. So we'll put a half ounce, two ounces in here, add the gallon of water, and that's it. So I'm just gonna spray the top and the underside of all the leaves. Spray every part of the plant, the flowers, the okra itself. And I would do the same thing whether this is a compost tea or a nutrient spray, fermented plant juice, anything like that. You're gonna do the same type of coating method. And that's it. And I would just continue to do this for the entire plant. So if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, then you know my philosophy on plant health, that if the soil and microbiology is dialed in, what it needs to be, the plant's gonna have everything that it needs to defend itself from pests and disease. It may get pest and disease on it, but the plant will not die. It will um, resist it until that pest or disease um, no longer has enough strength. So for instance, these aphids, they're gone now. 
we're getting colder nights in the 60s, they don't like that. They're out of here. They can't hang on. Um, so a lot of times with pests, if you can just kind of hang on, especially in a garden where you don't have many plants, you can just smush them, get through that initial infestation, um, and the plant's gonna be able to fight it off itself, and then the pest population's gonna drop off because maybe a predator insect came in, temperatures, climate changed a little bit for that season, and now um, they can't live as well, so they're done. Fruit trees. Fruit trees are trying to spread their seed. The tree wants that fruit to be eaten, okay? So it's not gonna put anti-nutrient and anti, um, like pesticide type chemicals in its, in its uh, fruit because it wants to be eaten, okay? So in the, the case of fruit production, natural pesticides are a big deal. And um, in order to have an actual profitable crop, you basically need to use them. Okay, I'm not saying there isn't some other way or some other thing, but and if you're talking about, you know, 100 acres of apples, that's where Jadam comes in for me. And it's a way that we can help convert a lot of conventional people over to this system because this is so powerful, but it's also natural. I'm not a fan of Bt, Bacteria thuringus, or um, Spinosad that much, just because these are bacteria that were found in nature. They've been isolated. They could have created in a lab and then uh, you spray those out and they kill larvae and the eggs of like caterpillars, for instance. But that bacteria can get into our gut biology. It can affect our skin biology. So I'm staying away from that. Anything that affects my natural immune system or biology, I'm very, very strict most of the time on what goes into my body, right? But in general, BT spinosad, it's, you know, safe, it's organic and um, it's another option, but for me, I don't like to use it when I have something so much better in the Jadam pesticides.